Uh, if you watch this back later and you're wondering why my arm is wet, uh, we just baptized people. If you're online there and didn't see that. So uh, that is why it happens sometimes. You know, today we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. And so I want to show you my favorite one. Oh, I guess they, they censored that out. Never mind. Uh, well, I said the other day I was in the kitchen and told my wife, hey, I love gifts. And she was like, why do you love gifts so much? And I was like, spiritual gifts. And uh, then I realized she thought I was not uh, talking about gifts. Uh, so today we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. Okay, you with me? And uh, there's nobody just like you, as I shared a few moments ago. There's no journey quite like yours. There's nobody that's been through what you've been through. Nobody dealt with exactly what you've dealt with. And so as I look around the room today, I just, I know a lot of your stories. I don't know all your stories, though. Can we give it up for all the, the college students in the house today? Man, I love what God is doing at RMU, man. You guys are seen and valued here, and we're really excited to watch God continue to work. Thanks for leading the way. We say every week, wherever you start or restart a journey with Jesus from is a great place to take a next step today. And so it's time to turn our attention to the third habit on the traveler's path. And this is not a branding thing. It's not about our church or our way. We really tried to ask the question, if you could do five things on repeat that would change your life, these are the five things we would call you to do. There's moments in time where there's milestones that are super important, but these five things we never stop this side of heaven. It'll be hard to share boldly about who Jesus is on the other side. Everybody will already know. But these five things we're going to do on repeat until we meet Jesus face to face. How do we take someone starting a journey with Jesus and develop them into a disciple who makes disciples? This is our best answer. And so we turn our attention to the third habit, serve faithfully. Can we say that out loud together? One, two, three, serve faithfully. I really love this habit because as I look around the room, I know that many of you already do this. And it's our desire that every one of us would step up and understand how we fit into the family of God. Not just from a sense of belonging, but a sense of how he's wired us. Uh, the things that you love to do that, that make you feel fulfilled. The things that you get excited even though it's work. Because you know, man, I'm made for this. I wonder if you know what you were made for. Ultimately, we are all made for worship, but what is it like to know our specific way that we're called to serve in the family of God? Just like our other habits on the path, there's a verb and a descriptive adjective. The verb gives us a responsibility of something we do that will help us become like Jesus, and the adjective addresses the way we will go about doing it. And so there are two facets of a healthy follower of Jesus and two spheres of influence. I don't want to lose you here, but here's what we want everyone to do. We want every person to understand the heart of a faithful servant and their unique shape that God has called them to serve through, their heart and their shape. And then we also want each person in our church to serve both in the church and out in the community. Heart, shape, in, and out. You with me? I'm going to show you how to do the first two of those things today. We're going to address the heart and shape of a faithful servant. And next time, we'll talk about how we serve in the church and out in the community. Specifically, where we're going, guys, is we want every person that's committed to our church to have at least one place they serve in our church at least once a month, and to have at least one place out in the community that we serve at least three or four times a year. And I hope we get to do a lot more than that, but those are in our formal, organized ways that we do that. Some of you have all kinds of amazing ministries. It doesn't fit on some type of organizational chart or a vision board. It's not on our website. You just do things because you love people. You, you, you buy groceries for people and you, you help people in need. And uh, some of you helped uh, one of our buddies move the other day, just yesterday, right? And, uh, on that steep road with those big trucks. And I saw all that. You know? But you just help people, don't you? Uh, but we want to do this together in a way that we can say we know how this family operates in and out with the right heart and the right shape. And so today, uh, my outline's a little bit difficult because 
We're trying to talk about a holistic way of how we serve with a, a good heart and, and, and the right shape. We're gonna start in, I think, the most important passage in all of scripture to talk about the heart of a servant. So turn with me to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. As you're turning there, uh, I wanna invite you to receive a free Bible today. Uh, we have Bibles in the back. One of our ushers will bring them, uh, our Connect team members will bring them to you. So if you just slip your hand up, if you're in the house today, we'll bring you a free copy of God's Word. We would love to do that. It's our favorite thing to give away. Uh, I'm gonna be reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV. There's a lot of good versions. You might have a different one. But we love, we love giving Bibles away so you can hear from Jesus yourself. So turn with me to Philippians chapter two. What we're going to do today is read this passage and then we're going to talk about the heart of a faithful servant, look at an overview of spiritual gifts, then the shape of a faithful servant, how we use those gifts, and finally conclude back with this passage so you can just stay here for the whole sermon today. We're gonna to begin Philippians two in verse one and go through verse 11. You guys find it? You with me? I think this one's on the screen. Let's pray together. Father, we want to understand your word today. I read this passage many, many times, but I would ask you to speak afresh this morning. God, if we talk about how we serve and how we work and, and do all the right stuff, but we miss the heartbeat of how much you love us as you became a servant, we messed up today. Please help us not hear this from a works-based, I need to do more mindset. Please help us hear this as people who have been served in the greatest way by the greatest person when we least deserved it. That we might be changed by the love of Jesus, our servant and savior this morning. It's in his name we pray, amen. Let's read. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isn't that a beautiful passage? You might read that and say some of that was a little confusing. I want to give you just a, a brief um, couple comments on this. See, healthy servants come in all shapes, sizes, colors, and ages, but they all have the same kind of heart, and the heart is far more important than the shape. In fact, before I would share with you about spiritual gifts, I would encourage you to remember that as Galatians says in the reference in different places, the fruit of the Spirit is more important than the gifts of the Spirit. In other words, the character, the heartbeat, the way in which we operate is more important than what we specifically do. You know what I'm talking about? Because God's heart for you is one of love. And if you want to describe God in one word, that would be my go-to. There's a lot of other words that bring clarity to the fullness of who God is. But in essence, God is love as his word reveals to us. And so when we serve, the goal is that people would feel loved, not by us, but by God. In Philippians 2, it says that Jesus is our model of service. 
That is, it says, have this mind amongst yourself. Don't think so much about yourself. Think about others actually even more. And it says, of course, you're going to look after your own interests, but it says, don't just do that. Look after the interests of others. And therefore, look at Jesus. It says he was God. And he had the form of God, the glory of God. He was enthroned in heaven. But he emptied himself and humbled himself. What does that mean? It means when he was on earth, he was fully God and fully man. Those of you theological scholars, the hyperstatic union, bring back some of those studies. And he was fully God, 100% and 100% fully man. That means he can relate to you, he can relate to me. He was tempted just like we were and yet without sin. But he set aside, he emptied himself of his godliness. It wasn't that he became ungodly, but he set aside his authority and submitted himself to his heavenly father so that he could relate to us and take up his throne once again after his death and burial and resurrection. And so if we learn anything from this passage, it is that as Jesus was humbled and later exalted, the same is the journey for us so long as we follow and trust in him. So we're going to talk now about the heart of a faithful servant, and I've got five things to share with you today, and we're going to go quickly. Are you with me? The heart of a faithful servant. Sometimes people talk back to me a little bit more, and I wouldn't mind if you did, okay? I just want to free up some of you in the room. You like, you're like, I want to say amen, but I'm not so sure I can in this church. Yeah, it's welcome. In fact, if you don't, I'll start asking you to say other random stuff, so you don't want me to do all that. Uh, so, so if something's good or something, you need to write it down, go ahead and, and tell your neighbor, I'm writing that down or whatever. Hopefully it's not my word, it's something from, from God's word. So let's talk about the heart of a faithful servant. I've got five words to say in five Five scriptures, and the first thing is that a faithful servant of Christ serves out of the overflow of being served by Jesus first. Everybody say overflow. Now, don't forget this. We're not here to learn what to do. I'm not preaching behavior modification this morning. I'm preaching the gospel, and the gospel says that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And let me show you how he did that in John chapter 13, verses 12 to 17. There is a beautiful passage about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Jesus doing the most lowly activity of the lowest servant in the house. This is the savior of the world. And he touches the ugliest part, the dirtiest part, of a person in this day, they would walk around with sandals, it was dusty, and every time they would go in a house, the lowest servant in the house would wash the feet, and Jesus says in verse 14, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I got a funny story with this one because as we started Travelers Church a couple years back, uh, we wrote bylaws because you do that for a 501c3. And one of the, I had a company help us. We had three sets of bylaws to choose from and they said, these are automatic. You'll get approved as a 501c3. So just use our bylaws and go back and adjust them later. Some of you have heard this story already. Well, two of the bylaws were Catholic and one was Protestant. So I chose the Protestant one. And about a year later, I went to affiliate with our state network uh, to become a church that's a part of a bigger family of churches. And they said, we're not sure if this guy believes what we do. He thinks we got to wash everybody's feet every week. Uh-oh, who is this guy? And I said, oh, yeah, we should probably go back and fix that. Maybe that makes me look bad saying it. But we made some great bylaws after that. And we did get approved. So every time you give, it, you know, it's non, non-profit 501c3 status, and, and we got it done. But we don't wash people's feet every week, to be clear. We do want to do the equivalent of that. And the equivalent of that is to become the most humble, servant-hearted person in the room for one another. You might have seen the Super Bowl commercial and they sort of, they, they're trying to paint Jesus in a good light, but they stretched it a little bit with the foot washing. Jesus did this with his most close disciples. Those that were dearest to him, he wanted them to know he would give up everything for them, which is what he would soon do after this. And so a faithful servant of Christ serves out of the overflow of being served by Jesus first. That's where we begin. I wonder, have you let Jesus serve you? in your greatest need? Have you received 
the service of Jesus, that is, unto salvation, to forgive you of your sins. That is the first way he wants to serve you today. Secondly, to gain the heart of a faithful servant. A faithful servant wants to please the master in all things. Wants to please the master in all things. The word Lord inevitably points towards lordship. It would make us like a serf or like a slave or like a bond servant, one that is bought with a price and owes something. That also necessitates the view of the other person in the relationship, a master. Jesus is our master, and so a faithful servant is not just thinking about the work in front of him or herself. They're thinking about how the master is going to feel about the job that they did. It says in Colossians 3, 23 and 24, Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, say, you're serving Jesus. Doesn't feel like that at work sometimes, does it? Mm -mm. Doesn't feel like that at school sometimes. Whatever work you do, you're called to serve a higher master than the one you see in front of you. A higher person than the one up above you on the org chart. A higher person than the one sending report cards in. You're called to serve the Lord Christ. We want to please the master in all things. Third today, to gain the heart. A faithful servant thinks humbly of others first. A faithful servant thinks humbly of others first. We saw this in Philippians 2 very clearly. I hope you saw that there. That to not think just of yourself, but to think about others. To humble ourselves and become obedient to whatever God puts in front of us. But Mark 9.35 gives a beautiful picture of this as well. Jesus said to them, if anyone would be first... He must be last of all and servant of all. Now that's weird, isn't it? Last. If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. This is not some type of bait and switch or a spiritual um, hyperbole. Truly, to think of ourself as last and lowest. This is the heart of a servant. In fact, Paul said, all the good that I have, all the best of myself, I count it as dirty rags. He says in another place, he says, I am the chief of sinners. We need to think of ourselves as lowest and last. So we think humbly of others first, amen? Fourth today, a faithful servant thinks humbly that no task is too low. No task is too low. This is super important. And I think we struggle with it, particularly as a Western church today. No task is too low. Philippians 2 verse 7 talks about this beautifully. And it says, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. See, Jesus did come not to be served, but to serve. He came as a servant, but he also had to take the form. He had to wrap a towel around his waist and bend down. A servant doesn't just talk about stuff. A servant puts a towel on and says, no task is too low. It's not beneath me, and there's no person that's beneath me. And so I'll do anything and everything it takes to show how much Jesus loves people and how much Jesus cares about them. No task is too low. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 and 27, it says, But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Greatest servant, first slave. I had a a friend uh, from another country asking me uh, about the history of slavery in America. Terrible stuff has gone on all around the world and still does. Here's the thing, because this word can really trigger uh, many of us as we think about the nastiness of how that has taken effect in our world today and still does. To be a slave of Christ in the book of Romans is put at contrast to being at a slave to sin. This is actually to gain freedom. This is actually to gain goodness in a God that fully loves you and has the best interest of yours at heart. And so slave can be a terrible word to hear, 
But in the gospel of Jesus, it's a beautiful word because it means that we have entrusted ourselves to a faithful master who loves us and will take the best care of us. And in fact, if we choose not to do so, what we are saying is, I don't need a master because I'm good enough without him. And we're going to find ourselves not free, but enslaved to sin. And so this is a beautiful text, helping us understand to be great, to be first, we become a servant or a slave. We stop thinking of ourselves so much, we think of others first, and we think that no task is too low. So many of you serve in different ways, and it's just a beautiful thing to watch uh, as you guys go above and beyond what you're asked to do, and you do more that you just saw was needed. You found a need, and you just met it. And sometimes we'll hear about it later, and I love it, so I get to celebrate. I have a, a good friend in Virginia where I came from uh, before we moved to Pittsburgh three years ago, and his name was Jeff. He was a master electrician. He's very well educated, a really sharp guy, and I'll never forget when he sat down at our new members class. He'd been at our church for like maybe six weeks, and he was running audio in the production booth, right, Aaron? He was back there crushing it. Oh, that's such a fun job. And he looked at me, and I'm thinking, this guy has so many skills, he could help us out in a lot of specific ways. And he said, Wes, tell me anything you need in this church. I'll do whatever. No task is too low. Show me the bathrooms. Give me the plunger. Give me the mop. Give me all the stuff that might be hard to find someone to do, because I would love to do that here and serve God, because he understood how much he had been served by Jesus. He understood that no task was too low. Fifth, to gain the heart of a faithful servant. A faithful servant readies to give an account of his or her stewardship. If you haven't heard the word stewardship before or maybe in a while, it means that your stuff is not your stuff. It's on loan. It means that your responsibilities are not permanent. You have a temporary entrustment from a master where they are expecting you to produce a good return me to produce a good return on the investment I've been given. And the best investment you've ever been given is you. You have been given life. You have been given your lot in this world. And God wants to make sure that you do what he's called you to do with yourself. And so we're ready not only to answer for the job, not only just to say I kind of sort of had a good life, but we're ready to answer to the master accordingly to Matthew 25, verse 23. His master, when he came back, saw that he had done a good job in this thing called the parable of the talents. The master gave him some money and he went on a journey. He came back and said, what'd you do with my money? And money is not just money, it's also our time and our talents in addition to our treasure. His master came back and said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Those are the five elements of the heart of a faithful servant. Church, if we'll get good at meditating on how much we've been served in the love of Jesus, we will gain his same heart inside of us. This is so much more important than the way that you serve, the gifts that you serve with, the place, the job, the position, the title. Forget all that stuff for a minute. Let's get the heart. Let's get the heart so that when our master returns, we'll be able to give a beautiful account of the way we were last and lowest and most humble because that's what Jesus did for us, amen? So we're gonna transition now uh, from the heart of a faithful servant to the unique shape. And shape is actually an acronym. A couple people much wiser than I uh, talk about this and I wanna encourage you, if this next part interests you at all, please sign up for our spiritual gifts class coming up. It's a shape class to help you understand all the different ways that God has gifted and wired you. But before we jump into what these things mean, I wanna share a really important statement, a really important statement with you that I realize um, I'd be amiss if I skipped. Your presence in the family of God is far more important than your performance. Your presence in the family of God is far more important than your performance. We can always get somebody else to do some stuff, but we can't get another you.
That resonated with some of you, but some of you don't know what to think about that yet. Because in this world, you will be treated differently based upon what you do. In the church, we want to treat you like the value of who you are. That will flow into what you do, not the other way around. Your value is not in your performance. It is in your personhood, your presence, because of what Jesus has done for you and because of what some of you still need him to do for you. So please don't come in here and serve more and give more and do more, hoping it's going to gain you favor with God or with God's family. Just come and be served and then go and do likewise. Your presence in the family of God is far more important than your performance. Bob Goff said it like this. He says, God often uses the least qualified, most available people to get things done. How many of you know that's true? We have the least qualified. I'm on that list, baby, and I'm so happy about it. I've told you before, I won't measure up as your pastor, so don't even put me up there. Just forget it. Just want to be a servant. I'm not trying to downplay gifts. That's not, I'm not trying to do that. All of you are gifted in different ways, and it's awesome. But it's just not about that. It's not about that. But I want to call you deeper. So we're going to look at spiritual gifts now. Remember what I said, the fruit of the Spirit, think of first before the gifts of the Spirit. We're not going to go into that today, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, and self-control. By the way, that's all one fruit. You'll learn that in our class. It's not different fruits. It's only one fruit grows on one tree, one vine, which is Jesus. And if you get connected to him, you're going to grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. But you'll also have specific gifts that show your unique shape, your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences. And when those all come together, you'll realize that's what God is doing with me. That's how I fit in. It's literally called, we're, this church is called the body of Christ. Think of appendages, limbs, and how they all work together. And your brain's telling them what to do. Jesus is the head. And so he's helping us all function together. And when a church is missing vital components, some of you aren't serving here yet, and we become frank in church. You know, like pieced together, doing all this weird, I can't dance. So, you know, but... We become frank in church, and so I want to call you up and say, let's use our gifts. Let's take a quick look at, a, at an overview of spiritual gifts now that we have the heart. Uh, there's three primary passages in the scriptures that talk about this. Romans chapter 12, where the functional or motivational gifts from the Father are listed. Ephesians chapter 4, there are grace gifts from Christ Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you will see spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit. I want you to note the distinction. Here we believe in one God and three persons as revealed through Scripture. This is very complex and takes a lot of study to still not fully understand it with our, with our brains. Okay, But what Scripture shows us, we see three persons all referred to as God. And then we also see God saying there is one God. That that is confusing. We believe in one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And you know what's so cool? In God's word, he wrote a passage about how all three of them give different gifts. Take a look. Gifts of the Father, Romans chapter 12. I'm just going to brush over these. I don't have time to go into this today. Go to the spiritual gifts class. Write it on your card. Say, send me information about that. It's just in a couple weeks. The gifts of the Father, um, what are they like or, or there for? Uh, they are creational gifts, motivational gifts. It relates to your person job fit. What will you do in the workplace? Uh, doing certain things well. They're your God-given abilities. They're what motivates you. Here's some of the gifts. Prophecy or perceiving, serving, teaching, exhortation, which is like encouragement, uh, giving, leadership, and mercy. Many scholars believe that you are born with this gift, because it's literally how you're wired with your DNA, being made, as God says, in the image of God, and that these gifts are activated upon conversion to follow Jesus as Lord. I'm not sure about that. It doesn't explicitly tell us, but it seems to make sense because you notice people in your workplace, and you're like, he or she's really good at this or that. 
Well, that makes sense. They're made in the image of God. They're really good at perceiving things and speaking the truth. You know, they're really an encouraging person. They make me want to keep going. They really have the gift of mercy. They, they, I've made mistakes. I probably shouldn't be able to work here, but I'm getting better every day, and they've been really patient with me. And then when you get saved, these gifts start operating at a whole nother level in the power of God. How do these gifts grow? By offering our bodies to God daily for the renewing of our mind. It says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that, that is our spiritual worship. We offer our bodies to him for the renewing of our mind every day. This is our wholehearted worship, resulting in discerning God's will and gifts for you, Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's the gifts of the Father. The gifts of Christ Jesus, what are they like or there for? They're there for the church. Don't take my word for it. After lunch today, go read Ephesians 4. It says they're to the church, for the church, to equip God's people for the work of ministry, to build up the body or the church of Christ, to make the church mature and Christ-like, and what's really cool is they're not manifestations, but they're actually people. It says he gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. He didn't give a gift to you to do so. He gave you to the church. And it says to each one. I want you to know I'm still growing. I'm still learning. And in the past year, I've become convinced that each of you, upon conversion and commitment into the local church, or one of these five people. I used to think it was probably just pastors or overseers or something like that. It says to each one in verse seven right there. And what's so neat about that, if we have a humble attitude, if we're teachable, we can keep learning. If I would have been set in my ways, I wouldn't have received that higher truth that took me 29 years in Christ to figure out. And so if you'll be humble and teachable and keep opening up God's word every day, he will keep speaking to you, amen? And he recently showed me, he said, Wes, it says each one. Why are you being so hard-nosed about this? Because some teacher taught you some way. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a wealth that we have in the body of Christ. There's more shepherds here than I realized. And they're not just here to do the work of the ministry. They're here to equip one another, teaching and admonishing one another. And by the way, if you're not sure theologically about what I just said, let me just encourage you. Aren't we all called to care for one another? Aren't we all called to share the gospel of Christ as evangelists? Aren't we all called, it said, if all prophesy in Corinthians, aren't we all called to start new gospel work like apostles do? Are we not all called to teach and admonish one another in Colossians? These are gifts not just for doing but for equipping, and they're gifts from Jesus. I got a little bit too much into that. I'm excited, you know. Let's take a look at gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, what are they like or there for? They're for the common good. Uh, they're unique manifestations of the Holy Spirit. They are for when we come together as a church or when we engage in mission where the gospel has not gone before. Now, this is an interesting distinction, and it would take me a long time to show you why that's true. But I do want to point you to a couple passages so you know I'm not just making stuff up. If you take a look at 1 Corinthians 14 and 15, and then Luke 10, if anybody wants my notes, send us a message. Say, send me the notes. I'll send them to you. Uh, Luke chapter 10, all across the book of Acts, you see this happening. It says that these gifts, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation are used in two different settings. When we come together as a church, and there's a lot of rules for how things are supposed to happen so that things don't get crazy and ungod centered but they're also used when we engage in mission work, specifically pioneer work. When we take the gospel of Jesus Christ to a new place, God often accompanies his message with signs and wonders and a display of his power pointing to Jesus. Amen. Here's what's cool about it. And I've seen it, so I, I could tell you stories. God doesn't show off if it wouldn't help people. He doesn't just do it to make us feel good like we're a part of some cool church or movement or something. It says, Corinthians chapter two, it says Jews demand signs and Greeks wisdom, but Christ is like foolishness and folly to them. But to us who believe, Christ the power of God, Christ the wisdom of God. In other words, stop looking for the gifts and stop, start looking for the Son. Jesus only 
lets us exercise these gifts for the building up of the body and the convincing of our faith. But he often declined to show, uh, to show his power because he said, you've already had the sign of Jonah and you didn't believe. You've already had Moses and you didn't listen to him. Why would I do anything else for you? And so don't chase the gifts. Chase Jesus, and you will see his Holy Spirit do powerful things both when we come together as a church and when we engage in pioneer mission work. That's an overview of spiritual gifts. Sign up for the class. You know, what can I do? Sign up for the class. That's a lot of stuff. What's prophecy? Well, sign up for the class, okay? Uh, sign up for the class. Um, let's talk about the shape of a faithful servant. So we, we're done three out of five things. Now we got the shape, five points on this, back to Philippians, and we'll call it a day. Here's how the shape goes. The phrase each of you or each one is mentioned related to spiritual gifts in many places throughout God's word. Each of you, each one. In, first, uh, in fact, in all three of these passages I'm referring to, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Ephesians 4, 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And Romans 12, 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone, among you not to think of himself more highly than we ought to think, but with sober judgment, according to the measure of faith God has assigned. Romans 12, 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to each of us. Let us use them. And so we can't earn spiritual gifts. You can't buy your way into cool, you know, talents and stuff. But God wants to bless you with gifts of grace that point back to him as you use them. And so the first point is that every Jesus follower receives spiritual gifts upon the moment of salvation. Go ahead, tell your neighbor, say, you're gifted. Mm-hmm. We're gonna keep this word growing in our mind. Say, wow, I don't just look at somebody like in the flesh anymore. I can see God's spirit working inside of them. I can see how you serve in different ways. You have some different shapes and sizes and colors and ages, and you know what? Different gifts, too. All for one purpose, to glorify Jesus through the church of God as we do the mission of God, all pointing back to him. Every Jesus follower receives spiritual gifts upon the moment of salvation. But we don't stop there. Let's continue. Secondly, we look in 1 Peter chapter 4, 10 and 11. It says, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Here's some examples. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this reinforces the same truth that when we use our gifts, God is glorified through Jesus, but it also teaches us one more thing. Secondly, as we think about the shape of a faithful servant, the purpose of gifts is to serve one another as stewards of God's grace. I always explain to folks as we go through our path to salvation and baptism class the difference between mercy and grace. I don't know if you thought about this before. Let's imagine a vertical continuum just for a minute, and this is neutral, right about head height, okay? This is neutral. You with me? We're not at neutral. If you've ever sinned, which you have, you're down here. Not good. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. This brings us back to neutral. It's forgiveness. It's the eradication of guilt. It is the erasing of the bad stuff on that board. That's mercy. God not giving us what we do deserve, but grace is even higher. God gives us what we don't deserve, and he elevates us from neutral to an inheritance, an adopted family member with, yes, gifts. That's why the gifts are gifts of grace. They're not gifts of mercy. Salvation is the mercy of God. And it produces grace in our life that God might elevate you to a whole nother level. And I can just tell you, if you've been going to church a while and you've never quite figured out your shape, you need to learn this because you're missing an aspect of God's grace in your life. Man, he made you special. You are gifted. But the gifts don't grow on their own, and we're going to get there in a minute. So secondly today, we, the purpose of gifts is to serve one another as stewards of God's grace. Third, we're going to look in 1 Corinthians 12 again, 
It says there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Varieties of service, the same Lord. Varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in every one. Take a look at this one more time, because I guarantee you 90% of you didn't see what took me a long time to see here. This is super cool. The same spirit, the same Lord, the same God. It's the Trinity. God wants to clearly state to you today that third, all spiritual gifts have the same source, our triune God. The Godhead gives gifts uniquely to each of us for different purposes, but all in one accord because they are all one. So we're stewards. We don't earn gifts. We receive them. Then we've got to refine them for the common good. Point number four. 1 Corinthians 12, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, in verses 1, it says, I don't want you to be uninformed. Isn't that good? God doesn't want to leave us hanging. He doesn't want to leave us uninformed. He says, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Why in the world does that matter at all? Because the gifts always point to the same place. Fourth, spiritual gifts always point towards Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you want to test the validity of someone's spiritual talents, you could say, look at where they're going. Is that pastoral personality seeming to build up his or her platform? or to point away from the platform so that nothing stays here. Forget the church. Remember Jesus. If someone's using a gift and they get sort of puffed up and arrogant, thinking, man, I'm something, that's not reflective of what we see in God's word related to spiritual gifts. Jesus is Lord is the ultimate result. What does that mean? Jesus is master. There's nothing too low. I don't even like doing this because I feel uncomfortable doing this in front of people. But I want you to remember, we all have to do this. I'm up on this little platform. Who cares? What's this thing worth? But it's my job. Wish I wasn't some days. Being a servant is fun. Enter the joy of your master. It's fun. Oh, yeah, the best place to be. Fifth today, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 14 and 15. This is how we grow our gifts. Watch this. Paul says to his son in the faith, his child in the faith, Timothy, he says, don't neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Paul is referencing a spiritual gift here. In another place, he says, do the work of an evangelist. I don't know if that was his his gift or not. I assume not, because that was work for him. It's probably a different gift, like teaching or something. I don't know. doesn't say. But Paul is saying he has received a gift, so practice and immerse yourself in it. Church, your gifts don't grow by happenstance. You can't just pray, God, help me in my gifts. You've got to use them. It's just like being an apprentice in any trade. The more you do it, the better you get. It takes 10,000 hours, they say, right? to be a master. And so we've got to grow. I do want to bring you back to the point today, which is that gifts, your performance, is far less important than your presence. Take a look at the best gift you ever got. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul's a little older. He's a little closer to death. It looks like it's just, you know, chapter 1 and we saw chapter 4, but that was the first letter to Timothy. Here's now the second letter, the last letter for Paul to write before he's martyred killed. And this is what he's thinking of now. He's not thinking about the gifts that his son in the faith had. He's not thinking about, hey man, keep practicing, immerse yourself, keep getting better at all this. Listen to now the way he uses the word gift. He says, for this reason, chapter 1, verse 6 of 2 Timothy, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. In this instance, Paul, like he does often in his letters, is saying the gift of God. 
referring to salvation, the most important gift we ever receive. So yes, grow your gifts, but grow your faith in Jesus. Grow your salvation. You've got to fan it into flame. It's just a little spark at first. And some of you got saved and then you got disillusioned because you stopped moving. You got saved and thought it was all good. You got fire insurance, but your spark never grew. It doesn't mean your salvation was bad. It means you weren't discipled. And you didn't put in the hard work to practice and immerse yourself in your faith. Dig in, church. Serve faithfully, because when you do, you will not only be a huge blessing to those around you, you're going to bless yourself, because you're going to understand more about how God has wired you, his purposes for your life. When you're not serving, you know what you feel? Disconnected. You know what you feel? Kind of lost out there. There's nobody I'm closer with than people I've served with. People I've worked really hard with. That's brotherhood. That's family. And that's five points. The five hearts, the five heartbeats, and the five elements of the shape of a faithful servant. I want to run us back through these real quick. You can go with me on the screen or not, but I just want to blast back through these because they're so important. Remember, your presence is more important than your performance, right? Check this out. A faithful servant of Christ Jesus serves out of the overflow of being served by Jesus first. Jesus did it first. Second, a faithful servant wants to please the master in all things. Third, a faithful servant thinks humbly of others first. Fourth, a faithful servant thinks humbly that no task is too low. And fifth, a faithful servant readies to give an account of his or her stewardship. We took a look at all kinds of spiritual gifts. What did I say to sign up for? The class, sign up for the class. Just write spiritual gifts class, something. Uh, write G-I-F-S, gifts class, okay? Uh, and we'll get in there. And then we learned about the shape, and we just did that. So I'm not going to go back through. I want you to remember the heart. And so we're going to end going back where we started, Philippians chapter 2. I had a lot to cover today. I hope, hope you guys were able to stay with me. I hope you can apply it to your life. But if you remember one single thing about today, I want you to remember that Jesus loves you. And that's why he emptied himself and humbled himself to serve you. And that is the only motivation for you to go serve others with the rest of your life. I would call you, just like our sisters we saw this morning, empty yourself and humble yourself like Jesus. It says he became obedient even unto death, death on a cross, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and declare every tongue that Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians chapter two. He didn't even count his godliness as something to be grasped. He said, it's not about me. John the Baptist, John three, verse 30. He must become greater, I must become less. Man, come on up. We're gonna respond to God's word today. I want to give you an opportunity if you'll take that connect card out. I've got mine right here. And I want to encourage you because some of you guys set this aside when you come in because you're here a lot. And so it's just easy, you know, like they already know me, you know, and just kind of do this with it. But as you're sitting in your seat, take this out. If you've set it aside the last few weeks in a row, just take it out. I'm not trying to produce something. Uh, I'm calling you to servanthood. And you're going to need some help. If you know 100% what your spiritual gifts are, exactly how you fit into the body of Christ, and you feel fully confident that you're currently serving in the center point of your giftedness, first of all, come and teach me. <laughs> You've really got it. That's not most of us, right? Some of us wonder a little bit. The rest of us, still figuring it all out. Tell us you would like some help. And we're excited to walk with you to find your unique shape. I want you to sign up for the class, which is two weeks from today at nine o'clock in the morning. You can sign up on our church app via tcpgh.com. But before we sing a song and conclude today, I want to take us back 
to the essence of the point of this. On our traveler's path, there's five habits. Serving faithfully comes out of the overflow of being served by Jesus. Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist. And Jesus had a cloth wrapped around his waist, not of his will, even as he willingly laid down his life. And as he was thrust up in the air to draw all people unto himself, he did so as a servant. And he did so to meet your greatest need. And it is not so you can be in church and happy and know what your gifts are. It's so that you could be reunited with him forever. Have you responded to the servant, savior, the God, man, Jesus Christ? If not, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that. I'm gonna be in the back, behind the cameras, just offline. If anybody wants to talk and pray with me, I'd invite you to do so in this next song. The rest of us, hold this in your hand, Sure, sing with all your heart, but consider what is my next step with Jesus today? I might not even know what it is. What's my next step with Jesus today? Can we pray together? Father, I was afraid this week that somebody would leave thinking about what to do. And I pray that is anybody still wrestling with that, we would just cast it aside and meditate on what has been done. Yeah, I'm excited to see lots of people step up, find their gifts. We want them to find you. Help us understand the richness of your love and grace for us. Not giving us what we do deserve, which is separation and death, but also giving us what we don't deserve. As you were lifted up, you did so that we might also go into the water of baptism and be lifted up a new man and new woman in the power of your resurrection. Help us understand more how to serve faithfully because we have been faithfully served by our Savior. It's in his wonderful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.